Hey everybody, back for part three. We're gonna wrap this up here real quick. All I've got left to talk about are the Persians and that will wrap up chapter two for us. Now, I had just gotten to this slide talking about the Persian empire. Uh, originally the Persians were, the, uh, were nomads that lived in the southern part of modern day Iran. Uh, they came from a region known as Persis. Therefore, the people of Persis were known as the Persians. It was the Achaemenid dynasty that ends up unifying the Persians. The greatest ruler out of the Achaemenid dynasty ends up being Cyrus. Uh, as time goes on, he becomes known as Cyrus the Great because he was responsible for unifying the Persian people. Uh, he ruled for 29 years from 559 B.C. to 530 B.C. During this period, he ends up creating a, bow, a very powerful Persian state. Uh, when I say he rearranged the political map of the Near East, it's because as the Persians conquered. And again, if you have seen, I mentioned this earlier, if you've seen the movie 300, when the Persian emissary first comes into Sparta, that's the way that the Persians operated. You know, and this is all based off of Cyrus's model that he lays out. They didn't just go to war like the Assyrians and conquer people. What they would do is they would send an emissary. They would send a messenger first and they would make the sales pitch. They would make the offer and say, look, your people will be safe. You, you know, talking to the king, the king that they were offering this deal to, you get to remain king. Your people remain safe. Your soldiers don't have to die on Persian spears. All you have to do is make, they would ask for an offering of earth and water. It was a symbolic gesture of a jar of soil, earth, and a jar of water pieces of that kingdom that would be taken back to the king. Just symbols of this region is now part of the great Persian empire. And you pay your, you make an offering of earth and water. You pay your taxes. You acknowledge the great king of Persia as your emperor. And your people got to live in peace. The only other thing was, like I said, if Persia goes to war, your people will send soldiers to fight for the great king. And in a lot of cases, now some people are going to resist and they end up fighting the Persians. They end up getting defeated. But others that join, well, that swells the size of the Persian army. That makes them even more formidable when they end up having to fight the next opponent. Makes them more likely to win. 550 BC, uh, Cyrus ends up taking over the region of Medea. It ends up becoming the first satrapy or Persian province. And it follows the, you know, a, a satrapy that joins willingly is going to be treated differently than a group that gets conquered by the Persians. Three years later, Lydia ends up becoming the next province. After that, the Greek city-states along the Ionian coast, you know, the, the western part of modern-day Turkey, end up becoming part of the Persian Empire. Now, not all of the Greek city-states did. You know, as time goes on, there are going to be some Greek city-states that chafe, that they don't consider themselves part of the Persian Empire. They don't want to acknowledge the Persian king. They refuse to pay taxes, and that's going to cause problems. But we'll talk about that in Chapter 3. Uh, once we get into the next unit where we talk about the Greeks. 539 BC, I've already talked about this once or twice already, is when they end up capturing the capital of Babylon, defeat the Chaldean or the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Babylonia ends up under a satrap or a governor. Most of the officials, most of the Chaldeans, they get to keep their political positions, you know, regional or local rulers. They got to remain in office. But in that case, because Babylonia was such an important region and the city of Babylon was so important, 
Cyrus ends up placing a satrap. He ends up putting a Persian as a governor of Babylon just because he needs to make he needs to make sure that Babylon is ruled the way that the uh, great king wants it to be ruled. He develops a policy of religious toleration, you know, where, uh, and especially in the Middle East at this time, you had numerous different uh, religious outlooks. And a lot of these groups were polytheistic. So you had scores of gods and goddesses. But they develop a policy of religious toleration when they take a new territory and bring it into the empire. They're not going to, the, the Persians weren't going to try to force a new set of religious beliefs on this group or that group. Let them believe whatever they believe as long as they pay their taxes, as long as they fight for the king, as long as they acknowledge the great king of Persia as their ruler. He didn't, you know, Cyrus didn't care what gods or goddesses they followed. Cyrus allows the Jews to return to Jerusalem, rebuild the great temple, and because he shows that humanity, he shows mercy to the Jews, lets them go back home to their brethren, lets them rebuild their temple that the Chaldeans destroyed. It creates goodwill with the Jews, and they are, they are ready and willing participants in the Persian Empire for the next 200 years. Uh, he even allowed Medes to serve as his military commanders. And this becomes a, an, a concept that is going to be carried on for quite some time. That when, you, when they absorb the territory, they absorb their soldiers, they absorb their military units, their tactics as well. And sometimes a, you know, a Hebrew military commander or a Mede or a Lydian they're going to retain a uh, position of leadership. And what that does is it makes those soldiers more willing to fight. It makes that military officer more willing to accept orders from Persian commanders. And it creates a better functioning, more well-oiled machine as this army continues to grow and spread and pull more territory into the Persian Empire. And because he treated most groups very well when they end up being conquered or accepting a spot in the empire, he didn't have to deal with, it's not to say he never dealt with revolutions, but he didn't have to deal with nearly as many if he had been cruel, if he had been forceful. <clears throat> now, again, it wasn't just with the military. He had respect for not just ancient civilizations, like I say in the notes, but other societies. He borrowed building techniques, traditions. If he saw something that was could be useful in Persian culture, he absorbed it. He used it. Uh, here is just an example of the extent of the Persian Empire around 500 BC. Uh, you know, you see. And we'll, we'll talk about this, you know, 490 and then again around 480 B.C., the Persians push into Greece, you know, two invasions of the Persian Empire uh, a little after this map. But, you know, up here is where the kingdom of Macedonia, Thrace, would be. And, uh, you know, those regions, you know, the Persians, up until Alexander the Great, this was the largest empire in the known world. Uh, Alexander the Great is going to push, you know, a little farther to the east, and of course he's going to pull something that the Persians were able, ne never able to do. He's going to pull Greece itself, not into his kingdom technically, but uh, the Greek city-states or a lot of Greek city-states kind of followed along with Alexander and did what he said because, you know, his father had been a great warlord. Now, in terms of expanding the Persian Empire, building what you saw on the map there, Cyrus dies in 530 BC and his son Cambyses II ends up taking the throne. Cambyses is the one that ends up pushing into Egypt. He invades Egypt. And again, where 
they conquer a region or they absorb a region, it becomes part of the empire and they start using the military units, the tactics of those people. If it, you know, the Persians didn't have a navy until they got to the Mediterranean coast. They absorbed the Phoenicians. Of course, the Phoenicians I've already talked about were a seafaring people. They had a navy, you know, because they had their original settlements on the Eastern Mediterranean and then they had their uh, colonies all along the West African coast. They had a navy. They had to be able to protect their settlements. So with the Phoenician navy, that was the tipping point that allows Cambyses and the Persian armies to conquer Egypt. Egypt becomes a satrapy. They end up making Memphis the Persian capital of Egypt. 525 BC, Cambyses himself takes the title of Pharaoh. So he's not necessarily, you know, this, this was something different for the Persians. Generally, what they would have done is the Pharaoh would pledge allegiance to the great king. Well, whether there was foul play involved or not, we're not going to get into, but the title of Pharaoh is vacant. Cambyses takes the title of Pharaoh. So it's symbolically, he's not forcing the Egyptians because the Egyptians were very resistant to change. Their culture, their civilization stayed largely unchanged changed for the better part of 3,000 years. So instead of forcing a foreign ruler on top of them, you know, you must accept the great king of Persia, what they do, what he does is, you know, this is a very psychological move. He takes the the Egyptian title of Pharaoh and he becomes Pharaoh. So this symbolically is him taking their culture by taking their political title. 520, you know, three, three years later, 522 BC, Cambyses dies. Darius ends up becoming the great king. After a civil war, you know, there was, uh, I think, one other family member, maybe a brother of Cambyses. Uh, I think there was also a general of Cambyses, uh, Cambyses' army involved. But Darius ends up winning out. You know, he's, you know, he solidifies his claim, you know, son of Cambyses, solidifies his claim as the great king of Persia after a civil war. And, of course, that took a few months. He comes to power in 521 BC and he continues to rule until his death in 586. Now, one thing he does, as his father and grandfather had built this vast empire, his goal was to strengthen the empire, to solidify those borders, because there were some regions on the outer fringes that control might have been a little weak, especially with the Greeks on the Ionian coast. One thing he does uh, shortly after taking over his, for his father is he codifies or he reorganizes Egyptian law. He ends up building a canal to connect the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. So now you have a waterway that con connects those two larger bodies of water. He extends the eastern border all the way to the Indus River, which is where it will hold until Alexander the Great comes along 150 years later. He even advanced into southeastern Europe. Uh, you know, he ends up making the Macedonian king at the time a vassal of the Persians, you know, a servant. That's the way the Greeks looked at it, was that uh, the Persians, that's why I say, if you ever watch the movie 300, the Persians are shown as bad guys, as invaders. The Greeks and the Macedonians were very, very independently minded. So even though in a lot of cases, other cultures, other groups accepted entrance into the Persian Empire, maybe even saw it as a gift, the Macedonians and the Greeks, they saw this as they saw this as an invasion. Like even as open as and as accepting as the Persians were, this was being forced on them. Uh, and also a connection with the Greeks were those I Ionian city states, those Ionian colonies on what would today be the western coast of Turkey. Uh, a revolt in some of the Greek city-states on the Ionian coast leads Darius to invade Greece. That invasion, that was in 490 BC, that invasion fails. You know, it's not to say, it's not like the Persians got uh, just absolutely defeated. The, honestly, if it hadn't been for 
a couple of moves by different Greek armies, specifically the Athenians uh, at the Battle of Marathon, they would have conquered all of Greece. <clears throat> but what it was is you just had a big victory at the right time. It breaks the Persian momentum. It forces them into retreat. That Greek victory at Marathon, it pulls the Greeks together, which generally the Greeks were, it seemed like throughout history, the Greeks were just as happy to fight with each other as they were anybody else. But if you did ever have a foreign threat to the Greeks, the Greeks would pull together, they would unite, and they would fight together, showing a united front against that force. And that's what happened. Once you have the turning of the tide at Marathon, the unified Greek forces end up pushing the Persians out. And it's not going to be until after the death of Darius in 486 that there's going to be a push to for by his son Xerxes to avenge him. That's what the, that second invasion is what the movie 300 is actually about. Uh, you can look on pages 47 and 48 for more information about how the, gov the empire itself was governed. A uh, little bit about Persian religion here. I do want to introduce uh, Zoroastrianism. Uh, a lot of Iranians worshipped... Uh, the elements in the sense that their gods, you know, like a lot of polytheistic religions, their gods or goddesses represented the elemental forces of nature. Um, Mithra, for example, was a sun god. But with Zoroastrianism, what you have is independent from Judaism, because again, Christianity is not around at this point, but separate from Judaism, this shows another monotheistic religion beginning to develop in this part of the world. Uh, Zoroaster would be, I guess you could look at Zoroaster in Christian terms, like a prophet. Uh, Zoroaster was not a god himself. Zoroaster was a man that introduced this faith. He didn't even introduce a new god. Uh, Ahura Mazda was a god that not just the Persians, but other people that lived in you know modern day Iran would have worshipped Ahura Mazda. But Zoroaster proposed the idea that Ahura Mazda was the only god, which was much different than what everybody else, you know, and, and he went on to explain, kind of like when I talked about the Egyptians and Akhenaten. When he became Pharaoh and he forced monotheism on the Egyptian people, his explanation was is that Aten was always God. The Egyptian people had just confused the idea and attributed everything that this god Aten did to multiple gods and goddesses. It was the same way here with Zoroastrianism. Ahura Mazda was supposed to be the only god. It's just that the Iranian people were under the assumption that it was the work of multiple gods or goddesses. Uh, the holy book, the Zenda Vesta, uh, while not exactly the same thing as you know, a Bible-type text, uh, it does contain what's believed to be Zoroaster's original teachings. Uh, Ahura Mazda, and this is a very very scaled down explanation of Zoroastrianism. Again, you can look in your text where it talks about Zoroastrianism near the end of the chapter uh, to, to get a little more information. Uh, but Ahura Mazda had all of the qualities that a human should strive for. You know, it, he mentions good thought, right action, piety, but Zoroastrianism was also, you know, there, there was a duality to it. If Ahura Mazda represented all of the qualities that humans should strive for, well, the counterpoint, while Ahura Mazda was a god, there was an evil spirit named Ahriman. And he was everything that, or he was the opposite of everything that Ahura Mazda was. You know, right is opposed by the lie. 
truth by falsehood, life by death. You know, you, you have this to borrow from another religious philosophy, a yin and a yang, a light and a dark. You can't help but look at Zoroastrianism and see, you know, see and make comparisons to, you know, the basic tenets of the Jewish faith or to Christianity that you have this all knowing, all being entity, God, opposed by the devil, Satan, Lucifer, who is a very powerful evil spirit, but nowhere near as powerful as God would be. There's a very clear comparison to be made there between Ahura Mazda and God and Araman and the devil or Satan, whatever title you'd prefer to use. Zoroastrianism seems to have a lot of similarities in basic Christian Jewish beliefs, just in terms of how people should behave. Uh, but again, you can you can look at more of that yourself. I am going to go ahead and wrap things up here for tonight. I will post all of these videos together. So don't worry if you see three videos pop up. And again, you're not required to watch every minute of all of them, but they are going to be helpful. You know, we are wrapping up a unit here. As we go into next week, uh, we're going to start preparing for our first unit test. Uh, again, if you have any questions, you know, several of you have been making use of, you know, emailing me, asking if you have questions and stuff like that. Again, I've had a few people pop into the Google Meets. As we get closer, uh, especially if it gets to the point where we need to take this test before we come back in person, uh, I would really recommend uh, people, if you have any questions at all, you know, asking, you know, popping into the Google Meet and asking questions. I'll have to go back and check if I haven't posted the study guide for this chapter already. I have scanned it. Uh, I want to say I have already loaded it into the Unit 1 resources, so go ahead and check it out. Uh, but that, it is a study. It's exactly what it says. It's a study guide. It's not, oh, this question's on the study guide. This, que this is a college-level class. That is not what your tests are going to be like. When we have a test, if it's in the book, if it's in the lectures, if it's in the notes, if it's in any of the packets or handouts that I give you, it is fair game come test time. That's why it's very important that even if I'm not assigning every page number in a reading assignment over the course of the chapter, you still need to be reading through the chapters on your own. If you don't, you know something might pop up on the test that I didn't have time to cover in a lecture or it wasn't in the notes. And if you're not reading through the chapters, you're not going to have a clue on that. You know, like I said, this this is a high school class, but it is a college class as well for many of you. And I treat it as such. I am not going to spoon feed the material to you. I have a study guide. It's to help you gather your thoughts, help you help guide you in your preparation to get ready for the test. But it is not. Oh, number three on the study guide. Well, that's number one on the test. You know, number 14 is number two on the test. It is not that cut and dry. It is not a copy and paste study guide to test. The study guide is to help you prepare, uh, you know, maybe refresh, you know, make you go back and look at this. And while you're looking at this term or while you're looking up this question on the study guide, well, you're going to come into contact with other information that could show up on the test that didn't necessarily answer this question on the study guide. It's just to help you help get you going through the materials that you've acquired over the unit and help get you prepared for it. But as always, anytime you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to contact me. Let me know. Email me. Come into the Google Meets. Leave uh, comments on the uh, Google Classroom, and I'll do what I can to help you out. We'll see you later.